Hello guys, my name is Nash. Welcome to Thursday Tales of Terror. TTT. I don't think I've covered a case from Taiwan, but this was suggested by my dear friend Chonghua. This case talks about the kidnap and murder of Bai Xiaoyan. She was the only daughter of popular Taiwanese TV host and actress Bai Pingping and Japanese comic writer Iki Kajiwara. What's frustrating about this case was the role of the media throughout the kidnapping. In order to get first-hand information, the media had indirectly led to the death of the 16-year-old girl. Let's find out what happened. On the morning of April 14, 1997, Bai Xiaoyan got ready for school, but she never made it to class. She disappeared shortly after leaving her house. The disappearance of Bai Xiaoyan was very high profile at the time due to her family background. Her mother Bai Pingping rose to fame when she was just 18. She won a prize in a singing contest held by Taiwan Television and following this success, she pursued a career in local entertainment. Two years later, she moved to Japan to study singing and acting. And that's when she met Japanese comic writer Iki Kajiwara and they got together. They got married after three years of dating and their daughter Bai Xiaoyan was born in 1980. But they ended up divorcing each other three years later in 1981. The reason for the divorce was because her husband was in an extramarital affair and had committed domestic violence. Bai Bingbing then returned to Taiwan and raised Xiaoyan as a single mother while continuing to do her best in the entertainment industry. Apart from that, she was very kind, had lots of fans, and she loved doing charity work. Bai Bingbing and her daughter would live a happy and peaceful life in Taiwan. Iki Kajiwara, on the other hand, died a few years later in 1987. Everything went well for the mother and daughter, until one day, Bai Xiaoyan got kidnapped. A van had stopped beside Xiao Yan when she was on the way to school. The kidnappers forced Xiao Yan into the van and drove her to a rented house. At this time, the kidnappers couldn't establish contact with Bai Pingping because she wasn't at home. So on that day at around 8.20pm, the kidnappers contacted Bai Pingping's brother instead, Bai Yan Kun. They told him that they had Xiao Yan with them and they instructed him to go to the Tao Yan Guishan Township Cemetery to pick up a package. Bai Yan Kun immediately informed his sister and the two of them went to the cemetery cemetery to get the package. In the package was a severed little finger that was from Xiao Yan's left hand and three half-naked pictures of her. There was also a handwritten letter by Xiao Yan. In the letter, she wrote that she had been kidnapped and she was in a lot of pain. She asked her mother to save her and to prepare 5 million US dollars and they must not alert the police or else her life will be at stake. She will contact them again. The letter was written on a paper that was believed to be torn from Xiao Yan's exercise book and her handwriting was pretty messy because if you think about it, her little finger was cut off. She was probably in a lot of pain while being instructed to write this. Without much of a choice, Bai Pingping believed that going to the police was necessary. The police immediately set up a special task force for this kidnapping and they camped in Bai Pingping's house to wait for the kidnappers to contact them again. During the time when Bai Pingping called the police, news about this was already spreading within the police force. And shortly after, all the major media outlets that were in close contact with the police were informed about this news too. I believe they had an understanding and they came to an agreement that if the media outlets were to receive any first-hand information information, they should not publicize it in any form or manner until there is a resolution or until Xiao Yan's safety is guaranteed. According to one source, the media was told to respect a 12-day news blackout on coverage of the kidnapping. Unfortunately, the media was greedy and the different media outlets were competing with each other. So different companies were trying to get their articles published first and they were vying for the front page. And in that moment of competitiveness between them, they had forgotten that a life was in danger. Because Bai Pingping was a huge celebrity, they were willing to violate their agreement and put Xiao Yan's life at risk. Disappointingly, the news of Xiao Yan's abduction was reported just the very next day by two media outlets. Fortunately, the two media outlets that posted about this abduction were not mainstream media, so the news didn't really travel that far yet. Needless to say, Bai Pingping was furious when the news was published and so she protested. The press immediately stopped printing. The other media outlets were warned again to not publicize anything until there is a resolution. However, they didn't seem to care at all because journalists, reporters and even vehicles with cameras mounted outside were spotted camping outside of Bai Pingping's house. 
they stationed there for 24 hours every day and even the hotels that were located nearby were fully booked by them. While all this was happening, Bai Pingping spent about three days raising the $5 million. On April 16, 1997, the kidnappers contacted again. They asked Bai Pingping if the money was ready and she responded by asking them, Is my daughter still alive? They let her listen to the sound of her daughter, reading the newspaper, and disconnected the phone. Because the special task force had been camping in her home, they managed to listen in on the conversation, but had difficulty tracing them. It's highly likely they were using a burner phone, and each time they called, the duration of the call was not long enough for the police to track down the location, and they also had some interference system on their end, so it's difficult for the police. On April 17, 1997, the kidnappers called again. They asked about the ransom money. She told them that the money was ready and they hung up again, keeping the duration of the phone call as short as they could. At about 3.30pm, they called again and this time, they set a place and they demanded for her to come alone with the ransom money and hung up. An hour later, Bai Pingping headed out. A police car disguised as a taxi followed Bai Pingping from a distance, but the kidnappers never turned up. The next day, on April 18, 1997, she was instructed by the kidnapper to keep driving around Taipei with the ransom money. She drove round and round, but still, they didn't turn up again. It was pretty obvious why they didn't turn up. During these few times when Bai Pingping had tried to meet up with the kidnappers upon their request for the ransom money, it wasn't just the police following her. The media outlets with their trucks were following pretty closely as well. They were adamant in getting any first-hand information and the most disgusting thing was that, in order to get better camera angles or footage, they were following really closely. It was impossible to chase them away. Not one of them wanted to back down because they were so competitive. It's not surprising at all that the kidnappers would not show up. It's such a suspicious sight with so many vehicles following closely. To confirm their suspicions on whether Bai Pingping had alerted the police, they went down to her house and reporters and police can be seen camping outside. The kidnappers were furious at this point because they realized that it's impossible to get the money. So they went back to the rented house and vented all their frustrations on Bai Xiaoyan. They beat her up really badly and they raped her as well. She was beaten up so badly that she could barely move. She suffered from liver rupture and abdominal bleeding and she didn't survive. They then dumped her body in a drainage ditch. On the other hand, the reporters and journalists kept calling Bai Pingping's phone to ask for updates in regards to her daughter's kidnapping. And it's frustrating because Bai Pingping was waiting for the kidnappers to call her, but instead all she got was harassment from the media outlets. On the 23rd of April 1997, the kidnappers got in contact with Bai Pingping again. They told her to meet them at 7pm at Sing Chu Stadium and bring the ransom money along, and they even lied to her that her daughter was still alive. Police accompanied her to Sing Chu with the money, but yet again, the kidnappers did not show up. At this point, the media outlets were getting impatient and some of them started to put out some bits and pieces of information, and gradually, more and more. Two days later, the kidnappers contacted Bai Bingbing again. They arranged for a meetup at Taoyuan but still did not show up. At this point, the police had made some progress. After days of telephone tracking and intensive investigations, they managed to identify the kidnappers, Chen Jingxing, Gao Tianming and Ling Chunsheng. The police split into different teams and looked for them. When the police were able to track down the location of the kidnappers, they immediately set out to capture them. Upon reaching the location, only Chen Jingxing was there. A gunfight broke out and somehow Chen Jingxing managed to escape from the police with a car. Chen Jingxing's wife and brother-in-law, on the other hand, were both arrested on the suspicion of helping to cover up for Chen Jingxing. The other two kidnappers, Ling Chunsheng and Gao Tianming, had successfully escaped even before the police could track them down. Twelve other suspects have also been arrested in connection with Bai Xiaoyan's abduction. Before the kidnappers escaped, they managed to burn down evidence in the rental flat. The police later realised that the kidnappers had tapped into the police internal line and had eavesdropped into the details of investigation, so they were able to escape successfully. On the 26th of April 1997, due to immense pressure from the public, the police had to release information about the case. An arrest warrant was also issued for the three kidnappers. Pai Pingping, on the other hand, held a press conference and she was sobbing uncontrollably. She appealed to members of the public to please help find her daughter. But at this point, her daughter was already dead. 
Two days later, on the 28th of April, Bai Xiaoyan's body was found. Her body had been weighted down with dumbbells. Investigators confirmed that she had been dead for nine days before her body's discovery. Unsurprisingly, the media outlets rushed to the area where her body had been disposed of to take pictures and videos. They were extremely detailed in their reporting, detailing every bit of information from the beginning to the end. In order to increase their viewership and readership, they even explained in graphic detail on how the victim had been brutally tortured and killed. They even published photos of Bai Xiaoyan's naked body. They even spec Calculated on their own and came up with their own versions of stories even before the post-mortem results were out and before the kidnappers were caught. They were basically imagining the process of the assault and they had their own conclusions to how the girl might have died. They wrote it in such great detail as if it was true. But at that point, nothing had been confirmed yet. The public were also very concerned about how the police had failed to capture the kidnappers. And this caused many parents to be worried over their children's safety should a similar tragedy occur. There was no explanation on how the kidnappers had managed to intercept the police internal telephone communications. The police had difficulty communicating with each other as well. Because the case was gaining such huge attention, the police force was under great pressure to capture the kidnappers. There were different teams working on this case. There's the special task force, the police force and other tactical units, and they were not working well together. They were not relaying information to each other, keeping it to themselves, and this was because each unit wanted to take the credit. A massive national manhunt was launched to search for the trio. Instead of going into hiding, they went on to commit a series of crimes which involved the kidnapping of Taipei County Councillor Tai Ming Tang. The kidnappers even demanded a ransom money of $5 million. Fearing for his life, the councillor did not dare to make a police report. The trio continued to kidnap another businessman by the surname of Chen in August that year too. On the 19th of August 1997, a gunfight broke out on Wuchang Street in Taipei's Chongshan District. One of the three kidnappers, Lin Chunsheng, was shot six times and was forced into a corner. Lin Chunsheng had died in hospital after suffering 11 wounds during the battle. A policeman was killed and at least two had been hurt in the gunfight. According to witnesses, the situation was very chaotic. Many police officers rushed to the scene but many of them were not equipped. They didn't have guns or ammunition with them. They were just running and rushing around without relaying proper information to each other and as a result, the remaining two men managed to escape from the police. After the two men escaped, more than 800 officers were deployed to conduct a thorough search. The media outlets were of course present. And for the first time, Taiwan's TV station broadcast a live shootout and the escape of the two suspects who were Chen Jingxing and Gao Tianming. Two days later, they were both still at large and under those circumstances, the police suddenly announced that Bai Xiaoyan's kidnapping case was closed, which was very suspicious. Two months later, on the 23rd of October 1997, there was an incident at a surgical clinic in Taipei. A husband and wife doctor and a 21-year-old nurse were shot dead in the clinic. The nurse was sexually assaulted before she was shot to death. It was confirmed that the suspects behind this were none other than Chen Jingxing and Gao Tianming. In order for them to not get caught by the authorities, they forced the staff to perform plastic surgery before killing them. One month later, on 17 November, Gao Tianming let down his guard and went to the kiln for recreation. While he was there, the police recognized him. Gao Tianming realized he could not escape and hence he committed suicide by shooting himself. The next day on 18 November, Chen Jingxing, who was still at large, broke into a residential house in Taipei at noon. He had attempted to rape a pair of sisters. The police rushed to the location immediately after receiving the report, but Chen Jingxing still managed to escape. In the evening at around 7pm, Chen Jingxing sneaked into the residence of South African military envoy McGill Alexander and his family were taken hostage. Chen Jingxing had forcibly entered Alexander's house via the garage. The first person to see him was McGill Alexander's 12-year-old daughter Christine who was playing the piano at the time. Chen Jingxing put his arm around her neck and forced her to walk upstairs where the rest of the family was. He then instructed another daughter, Melanie Alexander, at gunpoint to call the international media. She then phoned her friend Michael who worked at CNN. Within an hour, the media were alerted to the situation and police officers surrounded the house. 
At one point, Chen Jingxing was on the telephone with a news anchor and his conversation with the news anchor was broadcast live on Taiwan television. He appeared confused during the interview but he confessed some of his crimes, one of which involving the abduction and murder of Bai Xiaoyan. He also confessed that he had been involved in some other killings as well. As police surrounded the house, they reportedly taunted Chen Jingxing. As the police advanced towards the house, Chen Jingxing opened fire with one of his guns. The other one was kept pointed at Melanie, whom he was using as a human shield. After repeated begging by Mr. Alexander, Chen Jingxing released Melanie and took Mr. Alexander as a human shield instead. By this point, the police had entered the house via the garage door. Chen Jingxing fired shots at the policemen surging up the stairs to his position, and they retreated to the garage. As Chen Jingxing was firing at police, one of his shots went through Melanie's wrist and into her back, lodging between two arteries in her pelvis. Mr. Alexander was also shot in the leg. Eventually, Chen Jingxing promised to release the hostages if Frank Xie, a renowned politician, personally came to negotiate the release of his wife and brother. At 9pm Taiwan time, Frank Xie arrived. Negotiations started at 10 p.m. with success in ensuring the release of Mr. Alexander and his daughter Melanie for treatment of their wounds. Further negotiations ended in the release of the family's foster son and Christine. Mrs. Alexander was the last hostage released by Chen Jingxing and on 19 November 1997, it brought an end to the crisis. Mr. Alexander and his wife were not pleased with how the media had acted throughout the whole situation. They prevented their daughter and Mr. Alexander himself who got shot from getting into the ambulance and because there were so many reporters and journalists there, they blocked the path and the ambulance had difficulty driving in. And when they got angry, the media were annoyed at them. According to Mr. Alexander's wife, the cameraman and reporters were more interested in getting photographs and stories than in saving their daughter's life. And that was irresponsible and inexcusable to her. <laughs> In regards to how the police handled the situation, they were aware that crises like this never really happened in Taiwan before, so the police were obviously not prepared. In the first two hours, they began with violence instead of negotiation. But because of this incident, Taiwanese police developed better tactics to combat hostage situations. Chen Jingxing was executed on October 6, 1999, after being convicted in December 1998 for kidnappings, murders, and multiple counts of sexual assaults. One source stated that his youngest victim was 13 and his oldest was 60. Even after more than two decades have passed, Bai Bingbing still couldn't forget the image of a daughter's dead body. She still has the photograph of it and the tragedy resulted in her not being able to enter any body of water because it will remind her of the pain that her daughter went through before her death. It's really sad. Her daughter was a good student and reportedly an excellent public speaker. And she had planned to study journalism, but her life was so brutally cut short. And so we have come to an end for today's story. In the past few videos I've covered, it seems like the media had played a part in the cases. Indeed, the media play a very important role in society, but I don't think they should be irresponsible and behave the way they did. Because what they did could put someone in danger. Let me know what you think. If you like my content, please remember to give me a like, and if you haven't, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Thank you, and I'll see you guys again next Thursday.